You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. From Grand Tours to group rides, the Champs Elysees to coffee stops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Today we are in Eiliat. Where are we, Lionel? We are in Elat, in the Hotel Herods, sitting on a wooden terrace, overlooking a swimming pool. It's about half past eight in the evening, and it's still very warm, isn't it? It's been overcast all day and, and pretty warm. Well, unfortunately, I didn't get to see the Red Sea, because... By the time, well, we haven't finished work and it's dark. <laughs> well, we, we saw it. It's there. Um, yeah, I was hoping to for a bit more of a gl- a bit more of a glimpse. I was hoping we'd get down to our hotel, which which looks. Well, I've out got a nice the day by the Red Sea tomorrow. Yeah, I've got a very early flight to Sicily, mm-hmm. and I don't currently have my plane ticket, which is one of a number of things that have caused just a little bit of anxiety. Well, we've today. had a stressful day. This is partly down to us, partly down to the the Giro being. In in, in Israel, and partly down to just the Giro, being the Giro. Mm. Yeah, to <laughs> and, fill... And, and, and bringing elements of Italy here to Israel. Yeah, well, to fill people in, uh, normally what we would do is, is drive to the start and there'd be an arrow pointing us to the PPO, which stands for, in French, Point d'accès obligatoire. What, no, what does it stand for? It Basically, the point where everyone has to get into the race bubble. If you've got a sticker on your car, you... Uh, allowed into that area and then once you're in the bubble you're in the bubble and, and you shouldn't really go too wrong today's stage going from uh, Bia Sheva to Elat was 229 kilometers and really there was only one road the race was taking that road all of the race traffic was taking that road so what we knew was we would have to get to the start well ahead of the race get ahead on onto the course and then drive the entire route of the stage ahead of the uh, bunch well ahead of the bunch and arrive here and Elat in good time. Uh, but when we got to Bear Shaver, we saw no signs for the Giro at all. And we were, well, we made a wrong turning and we got stuck in a big traffic jam. couple wrong turnings, stuck in a traffic jam, took emergency action, didn't we? We left the road, we, we went off road, we, we did went, a Lance Armstrong. We did, we went across a field, muddy tracks. I was very uncertain anxious, about doing that. Anxious, I thought Lionel. it was a bad idea. I, th- I could visualise... Us having a puncture there were or three something. of us in the car. Tom Kerry from the Telegraph was there as well. It wasn't very democratic, was it? Because it was two, two to one against going across the desert. But you were the one saying, let's go across the desert. So uh, in true Buffalo fashion, we did what you said. And it was the right thing to do. It was the right we thing to do. It. We made it by the skin of our teeth. We did. And then we drove the entire course and we arrived in Elat and we saw the sprint finish. But this evening has been similarly kind of chaotic. The press conferences were so late after the finish today. I, I, I really don't know why it was a good um, hour and three quarters before Elia Viviani, the stage winner, uh, came in to answer a few questions. Um, I'm flying on one of the RCS flights direct to Catania tomorrow, and we're supposed to have collected our tickets this afternoon, but they're still not ready. There's some hold up. So our plans uh, are... Our old plans. We were going to have a special dinner tonight as well, weren't we? We were. It's your birthday tomorrow. and you're, I mean, the problem here is that I don't know what will happen to the three-tier cake with 40 plus oh, candles on hey, hey, hey. is going to hey. ha- What will happen to that A few now? for good luck there, are there? <laughs> no, it was interesting to drive the stage today. I mean, uh, it was a desert, so there were pockets of fans, but it was interesting just on the outskirts of Beersheba, the little communities of Bedouin people in living in, in huts, basically. These are not recognised as villages by the Israel government. They don't have any kind of services, no running water, no electricity or anything, but they're, they're allowed to, to live there. Um, and they are you know, nomadic people who've, who've lived in the desert for many, many centuries. Shall I recap the day and then we'll Do. get on with talking One other about little it. Th- thing about Beersheba, we met a guy from Israel, Gabby Pell, who lives in, in Jerusalem a couple of days ago. You'll hear from him in our episode of Kilometer Zero going out on Monday, but he messaged me to say Beersheba is the site of... Uh, recently commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beersheba, the last great cavalry charge when the Australian Light Horse Brigade, I, I take it, charged at the Turks in 1917 towards the end of World War One. There you go. Didn't look that up on Google. No, well, good. 
good. Well, the tale of the tapper then, stage three of the Giro from Beersheva to Elat, 229 kilometers. Um, a couple of familiar faces in the breakaway today. Guillaume Boivin of um, the Israel Cycling Academy team, Enrico Barbin of Bardiani CSF and Marco Fraporti of Androni. Well, he wasn't in the break yesterday, but the other two were. So far, so formulaic. They had a long old ride. Helped with a tailwind at times. It was pretty lumpy. Elia Viviani said 2,000 metres of climbing over the two... 129 kilometers so by no means flat but there was a rider ahead of them wasn't there did they catch him team sky <laughs> i wasn't <laughs> sure whether we were going to mention this uh, <laughs> yeah. well we saw team sky's principal dave brailsford out on the road riding his uh, riding his bike we saw him on a hill didn't we well the, the hill the i mean hill. it was uh, the the worst spot from his point of view for us to see him because he was um yeah, he, he was. It was quite a tough hill, wasn't it? Yeah, and a, a fan in an Israel, Israel Cycling Academy jer- uh, shirt t-shirt was running alongside him. I wound down the window. I was going to shout something to him. I wasn't wasn't sure what. Are you going to resign, Dave? <laughs> what's, what's the latest with Froomey, Dave? What's your reaction to the DCMS report? <laughs> no, we didn't ask him any of those questions. We drove past him, but uh, he. He does that most days. He rides a good chunk of the, the course, mm. uh, of all the Grand Tours, in fact. Yeah. Well, he wasn't in the race, though. Let's not forget that. He, uh, he, was, he was reeled in. He, he was reeled, reeled in by in Rod Ellingworth in a car. As were the, the three breakaway riders. And, the again, an anticipated sprint finish is what came to pass. Um, it was quite interesting finish because they obviously had a howling tailwind until about 1.6 kilometres to go. And then an absolutely dead U-turn. And then some roundabouts. A tricky finish. Elia Viviani of quick step won his second stage in a row he never really looked troubled sam bennett the irish rider from bora hansgar he was in front at one point but then did make a move to the right hand side of the road uh, viviani talked about that in the press conference he said he didn't want to make too much of it because it didn't cost him the win won. yeah because he yeah because he won but he did have to touch the brakes and go again and there was a brief touch of shoulders um but bennett for his part, after the finish, basically said he went far too early and he gave him a free win, gave Viviani a free win. He said, how many times have I led somebody out to win a stage of the Giro? And I was totting up his finishes. He's third in Haifa yesterday, third today behind uh, Viviani and Sasha Modolo. And last year in the Giro, he had a second and three third places as well, Sam Bennett. So very, very close, but no cigar as yet. The only move in the overall places is that Victor Kompanets has uh, was one of a number of riders uh, who lost contact on the fast run-in. He slipped down from third overall, uh, down the standings, so everyone else behind the him top ten. Shift, shifts up a bit. Poor old Kampenarts. Hey, we heard from a colleague of ours last night that he brought. he's been desperate to get the, the pink jersey, a little bit too desperate on... Uh, Stage two, after you know riding very well in the time trial, but he apparently brought a pink bike with him here. To Tempting Israel. fate, that is, isn't it? To wonder where that is. What's that? very sad, kind of poignant. It's one of the you know, lotto, a pink bike one of the lotto fix all mechanics is probably sandblasting it back down to the uh, original <laughs> carbon, ready for a respray. Uh, no wonder he's so <laughs> he's he's cut such a. But this is one of those questions, isn't it? When when a rider gets a jersey, whether it's the pink jersey or the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, and they wheel out the wheel out the frame the next day and the handlebar tape, all of that stuff has been prepared. So it's a bit harsh to say he's being presumptuous, but you know shows a certain confidence and a certain level of expectation. But no pink jersey now, certainly not now. He's lost uh, well a minute and plus. He's not lost a minute plus. He's lost 30 plus. 30 odd seconds. 30 yeah. plus. But I agree. It's, it doesn't look likely. The pink bike will remain in storage. Maybe wheel it out next year. I didn't mention Cannondale. Education first last night. But uh, Sasha Modlo made a bit of a mess at the end of stage two. He, he, he kind of delayed too long before jumping. And then his lead out man, Tom Van Asbroek, seemed to be in, in his way more than, more than uh, uh, you know, kind of effective lead out today much better and he, he was really well supported it was a fantastic ride by Van Asbrook in particular to keep him up there because Quickstep took real control of that finale today with all these roundabouts and they well we'll hear in a moment actually from Davide Bramati their sports director and Michael Morkov Michael Mercou as we remember when he was Lantern Rouge at the Tour de France and we were given a, a bit of an education how to pronounce his name For his first year Quickstep he's been a really useful asset for Viviani as lead out man but in the f- in the finishing straight he was looking around a lot looking for Viviani because Viviani had 
drop back a little bit at that point, which he, he likes to do. And he's not one of these riders, because up until then, it looked very much a kind of high road style lead out with four or five riders on the front, really in control. Um, and they went much earlier today than they did, obviously, at the end of the stage into Tel Aviv. So they did a fantastic job. And I, as I say, I spoke to Morkov and, and Bramati at the finish. Let's hear first from Morkov and then Bramati. Another successful day. It was obviously very windy out there, but the last few kilometres, quick step and a lot of numbers at the front. You really took control of that. Yeah, we did exactly like we planned this morning. We wanted to have the control at the, all these roundabouts. And when we first hit the front with such a strong guys like Schachmann and Stierbar, we had it all under control all the way to the finish line. That's what it looked like. Uh, you certainly came to the front much much earlier than you did yesterday. Was that because of the, the technical run-in? Absolutely. Uh, with a run-in like this, with all the roundabouts, you have to sit in the first 10, maximum 20 position. Uh, I bet it would have been pretty hard to be in a 20 position all the way through the roundabout. So um, that was our advantage and that showed how strong we are as a team. Viviani did seem to lose the, the train a little bit towards the end, but he's one of these sprinters who maybe doesn't need a, a lead-out man so much, does he? I think he needs a, a good team to support him, but uh, it's true that he can. he's a very athletic sprinter. He can really come from, from, uh, from, a, from a small bunch. And uh, I saw that he was drifting a bit back. And that's also why I just pulled out uh, after the last corner uh, to leave his uh, components at the front. How are you enjoying being part of this team? I'm enjoying it very much. I'm very happy to be a part of this team and I'm very proud to be a part of uh, such a successful 2018 so far. Tough end to this stage. Uh, you, your guys hit the front very early. Was that the plan to try and take control? Yeah, uh, in one moment uh, we put uh, Cavagna because we knew that that was a full uh, tire wind. Uh, and then uh, I think everybody knows about 11 roundabout uh, in the last six case and uh, we take the decision to, to enter uh, full team. I think the team did uh, a amazing uh, job also today. Uh, we lose uh, Sabatini a five case to go because he flat tired, but okay, we won, uh, the team is very happy. There seemed to be a lot of talking on the, on the radios. What were they saying to you? What were you saying back to them? Yeah, because uh, the captain is Morkov. When Sabatini fly tired, I said to Morkov, watch out, you wait, Lucas, uh, Viviani, you are uh, last man today for this. And then he said in the radio, OK, and it uh, was perfect, I think. Uh, he looked behind in the last 300 meters, and uh, we knew that uh, was 250 at the wind, and then the last uh, 80 meter only tight wind, I think the team did a good job. You've uh, worked with a lot of top sprinters on the team. I mean, you've had most of the, the best sprinters in the world on this team in the last decade. How does Viviani compare to, you know, Kettle, Cavendish and so on? Uh, I'm uh, very happy. Uh, I won in the past a five stage with uh, Cavendish in Giro for last year with uh, uh, Gaviria. We won a five we in the Tour with uh, Kittel and now Viviani. We won him uh, last year uh, in the team and now he's with us. Uh, he, he integrated very well in the team and uh, all the team support him. We are here for this. Also today, Shakaman is a white jersey, did an incredible job also for him. And uh, we will see now, we enjoy the, two st the first two stages. Finally, who's quicker, Gaviria or Viviani? Two fast riders, uh, they have a different uh, uh, sprint, but uh, we are happy that the, the bot is uh, with us. Yeah, Quick Step have got the sprints in the bag, haven't they? Look at their tally from last year's Grand Tours. This time last year at the Giro, Fernando Gaviria won four stages. At the Tour, Marcel Kittel won five. And at the Vuelta, Matteo Trentin won four. Uh, none of those riders are on the team now. They've obviously signed um, Elia Viviani from Team Sky this year. And he's slotted right in. And, uh, you know, he... he Taken now two wins, a bit of a gap before the sprinters will have another opportunity, probably not until prior Amare on stage seven, but uh, he's off to a flying start in his bid to try and win the, the Ciclomino jersey for the points competition. A San Francisco. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast. A few more of you have been uh, tweeting or Instagramming pictures of you in your 
Peddler de Charme t-shirts or jerseys. Uh, a little reminder that we're running a competition, well, two competitions. One is to uh, find Peddler de Charme for week one. Please message us however you can. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, email, contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. Give us your nominations for Peddler de Charme. We'll be awarding that towards the end of the week. Uh, they will get the lucky rider will get a Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Um, we, we've got a selection of prizes, though, for you from Rafa and Science and Sport, our other sponsor, to give away during the Giro. To enter the competition, just retweet today's episode and add a comment to say why you listen to the podcast. We've had some quite good ones in today. Um, I, learn, I listen to the second podcast to learn more about cycling and a lot more about food and wine, says Rory Kyle. Thank you, Rory. Shawnee Boy, I always l- listen to Send Me Off to Sleep. Never fails, usually about nine minutes in. That's a shame because he'll actually be asleep now. <laughs> so he'll have missed his shout out. I enjoyed also David Miller, um, not the David Miller. This this one is at the big chip, whatever that means. I listen to the second podcast, especially for the in pod adverts. Mind you, some couldn't be more cheesy if they for if they were for Wensleydale Creamery cheese. And Wensleydale Creamery actually liked that. So if you're listening, <laughs> sponsorship Wednesday, deal, deal in the offing. Advertising is available. Yeah, get in Wednesday touch. Day, a very nice cheese. You, they can have that one for free. Well, I'm looking forward <laughs> to when I go home briefly from the Giro tomorrow. You do have some adverts to run while I'm away, and I'm looking forward to you and Daniel uh, doing that with a plum. We will. We will. Excellent. Um, well, it's what keeps us on the road, isn't it? Richard? It is, Lionel. Absolutely. So business head on. Yeah. Now. Uh, you went to the Rowan Dennis press conference. He obviously defended the Malia Rosa today. Yeah, I did. Um, and he made the point that, well, somebody made the point in a question to him that it's the first time that he's actually successfully defended a leader's jersey in a Grand Tour. Lost it at the Tour de France the, the next day, having taken it on the opening day in Utrecht. Uh, lost it last year, of course, after uh, BMC won the team time trial. Um, but yeah, there were a few interesting comments from Rowan Dennis. Obviously, the big question is how far into this Giro can he go? Their stated aim was to try and win the pink jersey and take it back to Italy, which they're now going to do. Um, uh, but there's a sort of touch of the de Moulins about him, isn't there, in the, in the sense that people will obviously look at what de Moulin has done and say, well, is Rowan Dennis a sort of rider who could go on the same track? Um, but Dennis made the point that this year it's not necessarily about the overall result, it's about finding out what his weaknesses are in the Grand Tours Um, he said that even if he loses time he's going to carry on racing as if he was defending the jersey and that's the kind of the way that riders um, get their way into the top Ten overall. I mean, Bob Jungels has done that in the past, hasn't he? Having held the pink jersey and then ca- held on for a good result. Um, he was also asked about the start in Israel and whether it, you know, matched what his expectations were. And he said he was uh, really surprised by the size and the enthusiasm and the knowledge of the crowds. That was the main thing. And then that logically led on to a question about the big start being so far away from Italy and he did make the point that the riders very much would have preferred to have finished a bit earlier today and have been on a flight back to Sicily tonight so that they they may have a very late night but they would at least have a full rest recovery day tomorrow instead a lot of them are up pretty early tomorrow flying and then trying to get back into the rhythm of things before uh, Tuesday stage he said that he wouldn't want to travel more than five hours on a inverted commas rest day and you, when you think about that that would rule out a future Giro start as far away as Japan or uh, New York which are the next kind of frontiers I guess for um, the Grand Tours to try and reach Look who it is Lionel well, no Chiro, no Giro, but fortunately Chiro is here. Not only I'm here, but with my mind, I'm here with all of you. Physically speaking, in Israel. Mentally speaking, with all of you in Great Britain, France, Italy, Australia, everywhere. I thought you were going to lift maybe, every, maybe. every country in the world. <laughs> yeah, Richard, maybe it's too much. Uh, I don't think so, because as I told you before in our, one, our last uh, occasion, well, now nowadays everyone is doing his podcast, also maybe a former rider has lent 
Arm, I don't remember even his name, Lenz, <laughs> dear Lenz, I'm sure that your podcast is good, but I can assure that our podcast is better. <laughs> wow. I mean, is this, is this like an advertising slot? Or is, is, this, is this actually... <laughs> not even, yeah, that's not a bad <laughs> idea, actually, Lionel. Ciro, um, your you're first... Well, we've seen, seen you running around, busy as ever. You've been waiting for Elia Viviani. Um, he's been keeping you waiting. That's exactly. not an elephant in the background, by the way. It's a lorry. Elia, this is not fair from you, because I haven't written one line yet for tonight. And then, Richard, our my wake-up tomorrow will be at 4.20 a.m. in the morning. So, listeners, you can imagine how we start my life. But a good start to the Giro for Italy. The yeah. Giro isn't in Italy yet, but a good start to the Giro for Italy with two stage wins for Elia Viviani. The other man here, who we haven't spoken about yet at all, Fabio Aru, but one of the favourites. Any news on Aru? How is he? Well, I mean, uh, maybe in the first time trial, maybe he thought to lose some seconds less. I mean, he lost... 50 seconds from Dumoulin, maybe his prediction was around 35-40. But we have also to consider that maybe he was a little bit scared before in the morning in the recon, some riders as threw me, as Lopez and Siutsu crashed, and so maybe he took less risks. But in any case, in these two stages, he didn't lose time. So for the moment, his balance is sufficient. Not more, but sufficient. Do you have a sense of how the Giro in Israel has been received in Italy? Well, as usual, uh, when the Giro doesn't start in Italy, also in Italy there is a question mark why it's called Giro d'Italia, why the start is not from Italy. But as a clear tendency all of Grand Tours to start sometimes from abroad, this has been historical for the Giro and all for Grand Tour because it's the first start abroad, Euro, outside Europe for a Grand Tour. So I think that this news I mean, has been appreciated also in Italy. This is getting unusually serious, Chiro, but um, has this been a success from RCS's point of view? And do you think it's been hinted that it could be a precursor to taking the Giro maybe to America or even further afield? What Do you think that this visit has increased the likelihood of that happening? I think so. I think so. And already in the past, there was the idea to try to start uh, the Giro from United States. There was also a talk about Tokyo. I mean, for the moment so far, it's not, uh, in my opinion, it's not a moment uh, very very near. I I don't want to say, for example, for sure, next year Giro doesn't start from New York. But in a few years, question mark why not but listeners just to be clear i prefer you we'll speak to you more in italy ciro i'm looking forward to this the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport independent research shows 10 percent of sports nutrition products which get a professional rider banned trust science in sport the world's highest standard of pan substance testing. Thank you to our other sponsor, Science and Sport, for keeping us on the road, as Lionel says. Uh, you can get 25% off your Science and Sport products. We had some very nice emails, actually, recently from people um, just saying that they use that this code regularly and, and they're, they appreciate it, which is nice to hear. I know a lot of people do use it. We get feedback from Science and Sport that it's popular, so that's that's nice to hear. We all, well, we've had an awful lot of messages on Twitter and Facebook and emails directly to us, and uh, we have been reading all of those. But while we're here travelling around, it's very difficult to reply to everyone. But uh, we do see all the messages, and perhaps once I get home from the Giro, I'll work through our email inbox in particular and give everybody a reply. Yeah, we've had a few that we need to reply to, and we will get around to it. Um, I should give you that code having picked it up at SISCP25 at scienceofsport.com a couple of other little bits of business I, I, talking about Elie Viviani's stage win I uh, should have mentioned Max Schachman and Zdenek Stibar who were phenomenal really um, in that closing sort of well over the final sort of five six kilometres um, you know they as I said earlier it was a high road style bossing of the of the lead out they really really were um completely in control there were quite narrow roads lots of roundabouts which made it difficult for other teams to to move to the front but 
it was very impressive. Shackman in particular, he's been a bit of a revelation this year, um, and he's in the Young Riders jersey here, so uh, certainly one to watch. Another one to watch from from quick step yeah and while we're talking about teammate support uh, one rider i spoke to after the finish was bmc's killian frankini uh, young swiss rider 24 years old riding his second grand tour he started the vuelta last year uh, didn't finish it but he's here uh, and uh, i asked him what it's like working for rowan dennis and defending the pink jersey successfully we always had the breakaway on under control and then once over the coam the other guys from Quickstep and from Villiers came and helped us and then we went a bit too too short to the breakaway but then we let them go again and yeah in the final all was good and Rohan stayed in the front with the first group. A new experience for you, how did you find it? Yeah it was good, I know already from some races in Abu Dhabi I made the same for Rohan riding at the front so it was nothing new for me but for sure it was a good training for me and yeah at the end I was still in the first or second group and I'm coming so all good. What's Rohan like as a boss? Yeah he's very very kindly and he gives good advices and he's very friendly and he really is kind for the help and he say a hundred times thank you so really he really appreciate the work and yeah he's a good boss. So Lionel our time in Israel is coming to a close you're off to Sicily tomorrow I'm back home to London for a bit and then I'll be joining the Giro again Next week, we overlap a bit. Daniel will be flying out to Sicily tomorrow to join the, the, the Giro. I actually caught, well, we all caught a bit of the Tour of Yorkshire today on TV after the Giro stage finished. It looked fantastic. Great crowds, um, a really good race. Dare I say it, more interesting stage today in Yorkshire than there was here in Israel. But um, that, was, that was entertaining. Uh, but we reflect, I suppose, on these three days. We do that at greater length and, and depth in our episode of Kilometer Zero, which goes out tomorrow for friends of the podcast. Become a friend at thecyclingpodcast.com. It's the first of nine episodes of Kilometer Zero. And this one will just mainly be, uh, we'll be hearing from people, people who live here, uh, riders, um, a couple of Palestinian cyclists as well who we've been uh, able to to speak to through Stephen Tunstall who is a friend of the podcast who's been taking part in a an alternative Giro I suppose over the last few days um, and that's really great to hear their perspective but um, let's hear a little cl- couple of clips here from two of the interviews that appear in that episode uh, the first one is Sylvan Adams who is the Canadian billionaire who now lives in Israel and is a man behind the Israel Cycling Academy and he's the man who brought the Giro here. He's the honorary president of the Big Start in Israel. And uh, Lionel spoke to him uh, in Tel Aviv. And we also hear from George Bennett, the team Lotto NL Yumbo rider, um, New Zealander, who's here with overall aspirations. Just just very brief clips from both of them. Sylvan Adams first, and then George Bennett. Is this your first time in Israel? So, what do you think about this place? Well, it's not what I was expecting, but I don't know what I was expecting. So this is exactly, you know, people I think are first-time visitors like you are pleasantly surprised. They see a country that's open and um, beautiful and um, democratic and free and safe. And we're basically inviting a billion first-time visitors via their television set to see Israel, to see the real Israel. Yeah, no, you can't deny that there is this, this crazy underlying tone of uh, Palestine is, is is sort of like noticeable by its uh, absence, if you know what I mean. There's just no sign that there's a whole other country. Other yeah, yeah, I mean, which is a little bit weird and a little bit uh, yeah, disappointing. I would have liked to have seen some acknowledgement and some, uh, but it's just kind of flags everywhere. And but but you know, that's only if you read into it and you really look under the cover. I mean, for the rest of it, uh, it's actually an. A, you know, it's a nice place if you take it at face value. Two interesting points of view there. Um, we spoke to people who live here in Israel as well. And, you know, we've talked about this at, at some length and we've had a lot of feedback on the way we've covered it as well. And thank you for that. It doesn't lend itself to simple black and white analysis at all. It's so hugely complicated. Everything is complicated about it. Um, but... As I say, in this episode, we've tried to just include a range of, of views and uh, hopefully it all helps to fill in the picture a little bit. But two very interesting ones there from Sylvan Adams. Um, and you challenged him, Lionel, because some of the things he said were quite contentious, I think, and you challenged him 
on, on some of it. It's, and it's very, very difficult, though. I mean, I grew... Well, we grew up in the UK uh, during a time of the, the Northern Ireland troubles. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't have presumed to be an expert on that. And, and yet that was part of our, our sort of daily, weekly news cycle throughout the, the 80s, really. And this, this issue is not, not simple. It's a long-term thing. There's, there's an, an awful lot of history... Um, and all we could really do is try to reflect as many sides of that discussion as possible. And, and I, I, as I said uh, after our day in Jerusalem, I thought that coming here would in some way um, help me make, come to some kind of conclusion. But actually, all it's told me is that coming to any kind of conclusion is, is almost impossible at this stage. Mike Woods makes a point in the episode that you know they also race in China, in uh, Abu Dhabi and Qatar regularly and you know those places are you know have have very very serious human rights questions to be put to them too and we they, they don't when race, races have been held there they haven't it hasn't seemed to be the same magnet for discussion that Israel has been I think that's because a grand tour is something a little bit different and Maybe if a grand tour started in Qatar somewhere, we would have a similar discussion. But I don't. I really don't know. Yeah, there's some interesting things here. First of all, I, I've always thought, and I have said on the podcast in the past, you know, the the kind of watershed was when the international sports community basically decided that it was fine to have the Olympics in Beijing. And some people said that that was that was terrible because it was endorsing China's poor human rights record. Others said, well, it was shining a spotlight on that human rights record and people who perhaps wouldn't have known about it would pay attention or, or learn a bit about it and others said it might be a catalyst for change and I can see point, you know, all of those points of view being valid. Last year we did our ethical report into the World Tour team sponsors, didn't we? And we, that was a tricky one to do. It was Daniel's idea to do that and we discussed um, all of the World Tour team sponsors and made the point about you know Bahrain and UAE being states which if you read their Amnesty International reports are not you know they're not they're not squeaky clean and yet that those teams are directly funded by those governments um, effectively and sim you could say similar about Astana because it's a consortium of, of state owned or state invested um, industries and so when people say oh keep politics out of sport and so on and so forth I just think that is absolutely impossible when you have a particularly uh, thing like a bike race which is all about borders and you know the, the geography of somewhere and here in Israel geography is politics that's exactly what it is the two are inseparable somebody also sent us a, an essay they'd written about the maps that have been produced uh, for each of the stages here in Israel and the, 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 the things that are emitted from those maps. Really fascinating. And we'll maybe talk a bit about that in the Kilometer Zero episode as well. And, and you know, on it, when we're talking about sport and, and politics and, and sports events being held in, in controversial places, I, re I recommend a book, The Billionaires Club by James Montague, which is really about football um, and about, you know, in particular, the way that workers are treated in the UAE and places like that. And James really travelled around those places and met a lot of the people working in, in awful conditions and uh, and it's a really fascinating insight and and it's a murky murky world well just one last point we asked a colleague of ours who covers football and i remembered when england and israel were drawn in the same group in the european championship qualifier i mean just to put that in context israel have to play in the european groups for the world cup and european championship qualifiers because they can't play in the the the, the um, they can't play against their Middle Eastern neighbours because, well, politically they just can't. So they play in the European groups and I asked whether there was any ill feeling or a discomfort or ill ease rather than ill feeling um, about England going to play in Israel. I think they played in Tel Aviv that match. But of course the difference there is that the draw for the groups through those countries together to play a match. Whereas here RCS has made a very deliberate decision to uh, to come to Israel, so I kind of get that distinction as well. I understand that. Lots to chew on, and I think our visit here will has left will leave an impression, and uh, and certainly given us a greater insight into you know into this place. And it's been, and it's not a contradiction to say that it's been an enjoyable three days as well. It's been fascinating. You know, Tel Aviv, in particular, was you know I went for a run this morning along the beach, and <laughs> yes, but. Cities on beaches are wonderful, aren't they? From mm. San Sebastian to Nice to... Well, it, it felt Black very Bowl. like Nice to me. Um, yeah, it did. Uh, 
Yeah, and we, you know, we we can't pretend Blackpool, to but say. No offence to anyone <laughs> in Blackpool. We can't say we've seen the whole of Israel, but we've we've seen what we've been shown, if you like. And I think it's important to recognise that as well, because the the race has very deliberately not gone anywhere really contentious. You know, I think uh, it's important to acknowledge and recognise that fact as well, because we'd, it would be disingenuous not to. But we said we wouldn't go on about this issue too much in tonight's episode because we've got the kilometre zero well, hear coming from other tomorrow. people in kilometre zero. Much more interesting, with much more interesting views than us. True. Um, Lionel, before we go, you were going to just mention your most recent French special because mm. it was... Uh, uh, it was the start for the pink, pink Yeah, Panther. well, it's a rest day tomorrow, so there's no race coverage, so people will be bereft, bereft, I tell you, at our absence for 24 hours. Uh, but there'll be the Kilometre Zero and also the most recent Friends of the Podcast special. It's called In Search of the Pink Panther and an End to Belgium's 40-Year Grand Tour Drought. And it's basically, I went on a kind of wacky two-day trip to Belgium in search of a man called Johan de Moink, who people may not know much about, but he was... He is the last Belgian to have won a Grand Tour. And during the making of this episode, I had quite a surreal lunch with Roger de Vlamink, and we found out all about the llama he does or doesn't own. We focus on the classics. We're boiling in our own fat. Ronde van Vlaanderen, Gent Wevelgem, Paris Roubaix. If you can win them, you can make your whole year. Every restaurant in Belgium is owned by someone who was a domestique for Eddie Merckx. <laughs> no, no, uh, I've upset him already. He wasn't a domestique. Roger de Vlaming, I've called Roger of domestique already. The fans used to have bumper stickers of, uh, with Roger's picture on it, and uh, they all came to his, uh, to his home to throw these bumper stickers into his garden. I could have gone to ride with Merckx, with Bitossi, with Zilioli. I could go to all those teams. But I chose him with the understanding that I would be a domestique in the service of the Vlamic. Wow, this is a piece of cycling history, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, you don't get much more iconic than a pink jersey with Bianchi yeah. on the front. Daniel Freib will be devastated because yeah. it's one of his best stories is that Roger de Vlamic <laughs> keeps a llama. And I always believed him. Search for the Pink Panther, thoroughly recommended. I... I lulled a lot through that. Lionel, we should head off because I don't want that birthday cake to melt. <laughs> no, I, you have are, high hopes for this birthday cake. Are we going to close tonight's episode with a little rendition? <laughs> That's kind of traditional, oh, isn't I it? Can't even, uh, I can't even claim now that, that for rights reasons I can't sing happy birthday. <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Ci giro dalla tenevo giardina che la raccolta